Blood on the River, Chapter 18, Page 136. You did promise Powhatan what was yours should be his, and he be the like to you. You called him father, being in his land a stranger, and by the same reason so must I do you. And fear you here I should call you father? I tell you then I will, and you shall call me child, and so I will be forever and ever your countryman. Pocahontas speaking to Captain John Smith when they met in England in the year 1616 or 1617, quoted by Smith in the General History. When I lived on the streets of London, I was a loner. It was me against the world. But coming here to Jamestown has changed me. I have learned to depend on others, especially in Reverend Hunt, Captain Smith, and even Richard. I have learned the importance of standing together, of cooperating. My circle has become bigger. Now, this fire has changed all of us. Our houses, our food, even our blankets and extra clothing are gone. And it has turned cold, bone-chilling winter cold. And yet we have not all starved or frozen to death. Instead, our circle has become bigger. The day after the fire, Pocahontas comes again with several men from her tribe. They have seen the smoke and are here to see if we are all right. Pocahontas runs to where Captain Smith's cabin used to be. I follow her. She stands among the ashes, bends down, and sifts through a pile of burnt wood. Then she stands and looks at me. Her eyes brim with tears. It is all gone, she says. Captain Smith's house, his bed, his mirror, his beard-cutting knife, all gone. I nod. She blinks and tears run down her cheeks. She wipes them quickly away. Captain Smith is now my brother, my countryman. My father will send gifts to help. She says it with such authority that I am reminded that she is not just a little girl, but a princess. The Powhatan people, whom we have at times considered our enemies, now treat us as their own. They bring us deer skins and bear furs to keep us warm. Every few days they come in canoes laden with meat and bread and corn as gifts. We start to rebuild right away with everyone working hard. We make the fort bigger, giving it three new walls where the one wall fell down and making it five-sided. We begin again to build houses. January stretches into February, and it turns even colder. The night air sucks the warmth from our bones as we try to sleep in tents made from the ship's sails. Without the skins and furs from the Powhatans, we would all freeze. As it is, we sometimes awake in the morning to find one of our men, the oldest, weakest, and sickest among us, frozen in his bed. And once again, digging, digging graves is part of my regular chores. We make a very interesting trade. We send Thomas Savage to Werewokomoko to live, and Chief Powhatan sends us, his service servant boy, Namantak, to live with us. Our circles widen even more, and I think it is a good way to live. We are standing on many legs now, together with the Powhatans. I think of the centipedes that used to crawl over my bed last summer, and think we are like them with so many legs. A centipede does not topple in a storm. Namontek, our new tent mate, is 14 years old, or 14 returns of the leaf, as he puts it. Because he is a servant, he wears no copper or pearls. In fact, he wears no mantle even in the cold weather, only leggings and breechcloth. Namontek has bright eyes and a quick smile. He is taller than I am, and strong-looking, too. I certainly wouldn't want to race him. I'm sure he would beat me by a mile. Reverend Hunt says it is very good that Namontek has come to live with us. The reverend has been impatient to win the souls of the natives for Christ. We will teach the boy English, Reverend Hunt says, and then I will tell him the good news of Christ, and he will bring that message to his people. And so Reverend Hunt spends each morning teaching Namontek a few English words. Namontek teaches me more Algonquin words as we work alongside each other with the house building, and I am getting much better at the language. One day we are spitting clapboard, and he shakes his head. Our houses are better, he says in Algonquin. He has been telling me almost daily what things are better at his, at his home, and so I'm not surprised. We do not take big trees down to build our homes. He goes on to tell me how their houses are built with frames made of thin saplings. The walls and roofs are made out of mats woven from rushes. He says, says they are much warmer than our drafty houses. I try to imagine his village, Werewokomoko, and hope that soon I will be allowed on one of Captain Smith's exploration trips so that I'll see an Indian village for myself. Namontak shakes his head again and frowns. 
Our tribe is better than your tribe, he says. Your tribe has no woman. I do not understand why Chief Powhatan brought you into the Powhatan Empire. A tribe with no woman and children is not worth much. My jaw drops. Us in Powhatan Empire? I ask in my halting Algonquin. Yes, Namontek says with the patience one uses when explaining something to a small child. Captain Smith was adopted into our tribe. He became a son to Chief Powhatan. Captain Smith is your ruler, your where once, and so now your tribe belongs to Chief Powhatan. You are Powhatan people. What happens to one of us happens to all of us. That is why we took care of you after the fire. Captain Smith adopted? I squeak. Namontek nods. He died as an Englishman and came back to life as a Powhatan man. I picture Captain Smith, his head held down on a rock with men ready to bash his brains out. Or were they? Pocahontas made Captain Smith know death? I struggle to find the words to ask my question. Yes, yes, Namontek says, grinning. I am relieved. So they really did almost kill Captain Smith. But then Namontek adds, Pocahontas was perfect at the ceremony. Chief Powhatan chose her to save Cap Captain Smith because she is his favorite among all of his daughters. I bury my face in my hands. It was theater, a ritual. They were acting out death and rebirth, and Pocahontas was part of an act. Namontek asks me what is wrong. Why am I holding my head in my hands? I tell him I am just tired. Now it all makes sense. The gifts of food and animal furs, the sudden peace between us. Chief Powhatan is taking care of us because he considers us one of his tribes. If it were just me, I would be very happy with the arrangement. It means survival and peace. It means an end to the bloodshed between our settlers and the Powhatans. But I know these gentlemen, and I know they have no interest in being the subjects of a man they consider, consider to be a lowly savage. I also know that President Ratcliffe would be quite surprised to find out that Chief Powhatan thinks Captain Smith is our real ruler. My hope is that, with no one to explain it to them, the gentlemen simply won't find out that Powhatan now considers us his subjects. By spring, we have dug a well for clean, fresh water. We have also built enough houses for everyone and a new church for Reverend Hunt to hold our daily services in. Captain Newport's ship is again loaded with rocks that we hope contain gold. I have not totally given up on my dreams of riches from this new world, but those hopes have certainly dimmed. The ship also carries three new passengers. Master Wingfield and Master Archer are being sent back to England in dishonor. And Namontek is going to England so that he can come back and tell Chief Powhatan all about it. Namontek shows me a stick Chief Powhatan has given him. I will count the people and make marks on the stick, he says. I will be able to tell Chief Powhatan how many people there are in your land. I laugh, remembering the teeming streets of London, with carriages and horses and people and hogs all vying for space on the cobblestones. I think of Namontek walking along the docks the same docks I left so many months ago, and seen our world for the first time. I wonder what he will think of St. Paul's Church, with its pinnacles and tower rising high as Virginia trees, or the rows and rows of waddle and daub houses, with gangs of dirty children playing out front. How the English will stare at him with his deerskin breechcloth and bare chest. I think he will need many, many sticks to count all the people in England, but I don't tell him so. I say goodbye and wish him a safe voyage. The summer of 1608 is much better than the summer of 1607. We now have fresh water from our well, houses for everyone instead of tents, and peace with the natives. Captain Smith continues our trading, so food is plentiful. Still, a sickness come up, comes upon us. We now call it the summer sickness, and many of our men are too weak to work. There are the usual conjectures about what it can be, the usual suspicion that there is a Spanish spy among us who is slipping rat's bane into our food and drink. But Reverend Hunt says he thinks it has something to do with the mosquitoes. We get sick as soon as they start to buzz and bite. One day, while Captain Smith is away on an exploration trip up the river, President Ratcliffe makes a decision that costs him his presidency. He decides he wants a large house in the woods, a house befitting a president and that the lot of us hot, itchy, feverish men and boys will build it for him. He forces us to work with a threat of whipping if we refuse. 
By the time Captain Smith returns a week later and finds out what is going on, we are angry as a nest of hornets. He's worse than Wingfield, Henry shouts. He's been eating more than his share of the stores and lying idle while we sweat and faint in the heat, Nathaniel complains. He's unfit to be president, John Layden declares. There is more angry discussion, and by the end of the day it is decided. Captain Ratcliffe will no longer be our president. He will be sent back to England with the next supply ship. Then the debate begins about who should be our new president. It must be a man who cares about the whole colony, not just of himself and a few friends. They want someone who is fair and willing to do his share of the work, not sit idle giving orders. They want someone who has been here since the beginning, who knows about how to survive in Virginia. When, they're make, when they make their choice, I am amazed and proud. Captain John Smith will be our new president.